Happy holidays, everybody, and welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. I'm Pastor Jerry. It's the Christmas season, and we are excited here at the church. And if you want to stay in the know and all that's happening here, do us a favor and text Christmas to 96995. Or head over to the website at springcreekchurch.org backslash Christmas for all the information. Do us a favor this morning. Grab your Bible, grab your favorite cup of coffee, or your favorite cup of eggnog, and let's go into the Word. This is the second Sunday in Advent. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle, hope, to remember that Advent is a time of preparation, getting our hearts ready for the coming of Jesus and making more space for Christ in our lives. In the second week of Advent, help us remember that through Jesus, we can embrace a Christmas free from turmoil and chaos. Regardless of our circumstances, Christ offers us a peace that surpasses understanding. At the first Christmas, Jesus was born, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. The angels themselves proclaimed, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. The angels recognized the profound gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love that Christmas holds. They understood that the fullness of God was wrapped in the form of a humble infant, Emmanuel, God with us, in the baby Jesus. We can experience profound peace in our hearts on Christmas Day and every day because Jesus intercedes for us. He not only paid our sin debt, but loves us with an incomprehensible love that nothing can separate us from his goodness and his plans for us are unwaveringly good. During the second week of Advent, may we be kept in perfect peace as our minds remain focused on the truth of God's powerful love the ability to trust him completely and finding rest in the peace he provides. Isaiah 40 verses three through five says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Today, we're lighting the candle of peace or the Bethlehem candle. Help us remember that through Jesus, we can embrace a Christmas free from turmoil and chaos. Regardless of our circumstances, God gives us a peace that surpasses understanding. This week, we want you to meditate and think on where have you experienced a peace that surpasses your understanding? Where do you need God's peace in your life? Welcome to Spring Creek Online, where we're in a brand new series this holiday season called My Life is Not a Hallmark Movie. Today's message is entitled When Silent Night is the Loneliest Night. We're going to be looking at the topic of loneliness today. If you will, join me for a brief word of prayer. Father, this is your time and we believe, God, that you're already here among us, working, preparing our hearts for the things we need to hear today. And I just pray that because of this message, that, that someone will have the courage to admit um, that they're lonely and the things that are causing that loneliness and break out of that spiral in order to embrace living and loving your way. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's become a Christmas classic, and for many people, Christmas is not Christmas unless and until they get to watch the movie Home Alone. Now, I'm pretty sure most of y'all have seen it. It's a story of an eight-year-old, Kevin McAllister, who lives with his wealthy family in a large house in Chicago. For Christmas, the family decides to go on a European vacation along with their relatives. With all the additional guests in their home the night before, uh, there's just so much chaos and confusion before they have to leave. Kevin is not on his best behavior and is getting into a lot of trouble. Eventually, he's sent to bed in the attic bedroom as a punishment. Well, Kevin throws a fit, tells his mom that he hates her, and he wishes he never had to see his family again. Well, the next morning, they have an early flight, but everyone wakes up late. In all the confusion of getting out the door to make it to the airport on time, Kevin is forgotten and left sleeping up in the attic. But the parents didn't know that. They think Kevin is with them. He's just hanging out with all of his cousins. So when Kevin finally wakes up to find out that he's the only one in the house, he thinks his wish has been granted. His family's disappeared, and he couldn't be happier. 
Now he can do whatever he wants to do. He can watch whatever he wants to watch on television. He can go into his brother's room and snoop around. And there's nobody there to tell him what he can and cannot do. But there's two crooks, Harry and Marv, who are robbing houses in the neighborhood. Since most of the families are away on vacation, they target Kevin's house next. Well, in the movie, Kevin sets up all sorts of booby traps to protect his house from the crooks. But in the end, Kevin realizes he has a problem. Being home alone is not what he thought it would be. He's lonely. And now he's sorry that he ever wished his family away and he wants them back again. So ultimately, the movie Home Alone is about a kid who discovers that being alone can be very lonely. Do you ever feel lonely? Lee Strobel, in his book, God's Outrageous Claims, said people today will admit to almost any problem drugs, alcoholism, sexual addiction, and so on and so forth. But then he adds, but there's one admission that people are loath to make. Whether they're a star on television or someone who fixes televisions in a repair shop, it's just too embarrassing. It penetrates too deeply to the core of who they are. People don't want to admit that they are sometimes lonely. In fact, new research just released by the mental health charity Mind tells us a third of people, 36%, are too embarrassed to admit that they're lonely at Christmas. Which means most of us are experiencing a level of shame when it comes to loneliness. So instead of being open and honest about it, we hide the truth of how lonely we actually feel. How common is loneliness? Well, according to Los Angeles psychiatrist, Dr. Leonard Zunin, despite the fact that the average American speak, uh, meets many people, as many people in one year as their ancestors met in a lifetime 100 years ago, Loneliness is the main problem facing Americans today. Or how about this from the author Thomas Wolfe? The whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon peculiar to myself and a few other solitary men, is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. Bottom line, loneliness is common. It's an everyday experience for most people. And the feeling of loneliness is only compounded at Christmas because this is a time when families are getting together and seem to be enjoying one another's company. In an article for Psychology Today, Dr. Guy Winch made this observation. Lonely people dread the holiday season more than any other time of the year. Watching everyone around them connect to those they love makes their own feelings of emotional isolation even more profound. Indeed, the holidays can make loneliness feel especially excruciating, which is probably one of the things most min misunderstood about loneliness. Loneliness is not merely a matter of being alone, because a lot of us experience loneliness in a crowd. Loneliness is not about not feeling connected, not about being alone. I don't know if you've seen it, but the History Channel has a hit series called Alone. It's now in its eighth season. Contestants are dropped off in a remote wilderness location with minimal supplies to see who can survive the longest completely alone. Well, in the very first season of the show, the contestants were left on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and the winner was a man from Blairsville, Georgia, named Alan Kay. He lived on a diet of seaweed, fish, snails, and slugs during his 56 days alone in the wilderness. He lost 60 pounds and won the half-million-dollar prize. Later, Alan was asked by a fan of the show, what was the loneliest moment you had there and how did you overcome it? Alan's answer is very compelling. In the woods, I usually don't feel too terribly alone. You've got the animals, you've got yourself, your mind. Honestly, I feel more alone when I'm with people and in society. I've been in crowds of people or a room full of people and felt completely alone. Everybody is so detached anyway. Nobody's looking at each other. Nobody's paying attention to each other. Alan Kay is exactly right. Loneliness is not about whether or not you're alone. It's about whether or not you're feeling connected with those who are around you. You can be alone in a crowd, and sometimes the most desperate type of loneliness is when you feel alone in your marriage or at a party with your friends or when your family gathers for a special occasion like Christmas. So let's begin by looking at the many faces of loneliness. In the Psalms, David wrote this, Look right, look left. There's not a soul who cares about what happens. I'm up against it with no exit, bereft, left alone. I cry out, God, call out, you're my last chance, my only hope for life. The cry of the lonely heart comes in all shapes and sizes, like in this first category, the young and old. 
The holidays are a time when ma that may many people associate with happiness and joy, yet more than half of Americans are feeling something entirely different. Listen to this. A sizable 55% of Americans are experiencing sadness and loneliness during, this ho during the holidays this year, including 35% who say it's worse than last year. That according to Value Penguin survey back in 2022. So more than half of us right now are experiencing what I call the winter blues. But here's what I find most fascinating. Almost of, among all the various age groups that there are, Gen Z, so those are the young people between the age of 18 and 25, are the ones who experience the most loneliness, with 75% of that generation admitting to feeling loneliness at Christmas. You might be tempted to think of them as kind of young and carefree, but the truth is young people are very prone to loneliness. Or how about this, John Woodward? He's a researcher at the University of Nebraska. He's researched loneliness for years, and he says this, for high school girls, the more activities they join, the lonelier they are. They're lonelier than alcoholics, unweighed teenage moms, and even the elderly. As a group, high school girls are more abjectly lonely than anybody. The truth is most teenagers fear loneliness like the plague. It's why so many of them are willing to go along with the crowd and sometimes even do foolish or destructive things because they can't stand to be alone, to feel left out, or to be looked on as different. But the elderly also face loneliness. Did you know that 70% of elderly people who live in nursing homes never get a single visit from an outsider? Even the elderly still living at home often find themselves socially isolated for weeks and sometimes months at a time. Spouses and others in their social network have all died, have they, or they've moved off to live with and be cared for by their families, or are in extended care facilities themselves. Both the young and the old deal with loneliness, as do the singles and married. You know, I've said many times that loneliness is not a singles issue. It's not. Loneliness is a human issue. I've known many singles who were absolutely convinced that they would be happier and less lonely if they were married. And I've known an equal number of married people who woke up thinking they'd be happier and less lonely if they were single. You know, I can honestly say that the loneliest I've ever felt in my life was at the height of our marriage problems when I looked at my wife sleeping inches away from me, who was miles away from me emotionally and relationally. In fact, this is a persistent or fairly persistent finding uh, from the Gottman Institute, which works and studies good marriages. They found in 2019, 61% of Americans reported that they were lonely. 47% of adults said they sometimes or always felt their relationships were not meaningful. Again, we're talking sizable numbers here. Do you ever feel lonely even when you're with others? It's like there's a separation between you and them that you don't know quite how to fix. You know, it's been said that no two happy marriages are identical. But every lonely marriage has one thing in common. At least one spouse feels abandoned emotionally. This is what the actor-comedian Robin Williams was driving at when he said, I used to think being alone was the worst thing. It's not. It's being with people who make you feel alone. So singles who live alone do battle with loneliness, and married people who live together do battle with loneliness. But loneliness also affects the women and men. Even though both sexes struggle with loneliness, women tend to carry more shame about it. In an article in Today's Christian Woman, Nancy Smith, who's a Christian therapist, said it like this. Loneliness is a hard thing for most people to talk about. There's a sense of shame connected to it. The most common misconception I find in my practice is that women believe it's their fault and that it will last forever. You know, it seems that women seem to be better wired up for relationship. And as a result, when a woman faces loneliness, she often feels a certain level of gender shame, that she must not have what it takes, that she is somehow defective. But loneliness, like I said, is not unique to women. Men are notorious for having casual surface relationships with others. They have business associates, they have customers, they have golf buddies, they have fishing pals. Often men have numerous superficial relationships and no one with whom they experience deep friendship. Jim Conway is the author of several books dealing with men's issues, and he said it like this. The American male is lonely and friendless, but he tries to maintain his macho image at all costs, even if it means isolation from people. 
There are even some studies that suggest, in particular, successful men are some of the most lonely people on the face of the planet. But there's one more category of lonely people I need to mention, and that's the believer and non-believer. Being a follower of God does not exempt you from, from loneliness. Some of God's choicest servants were all too familiar with this feeling. Like David, he wrote, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Or Job. Job wrote, My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My kinsmen have gone away. My friends have forgotten me. My guests count me as strange. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. So whether you have a God orientation or not doesn't seem to make a difference when it comes to loneliness because loneliness is no respecter of persons. Now let's take a few moments and better acquaint ourselves with how this feeling takes root in our life and what it does. I call this next point the downward spiral of loneliness. First, let me point out that there are three types of loneliness. The first type we're going to call transient loneliness. Transient loneliness is a passing feeling. It may last only a few minutes, hours, or days. I've heard it said that even though we're the most connected people ever to information, we're also the most disconnected people ever from one another. Many of us spend a significant portion of our days staring at computer screens, scrolling through our phones, or watching television. Conversations are so sped up that we prefer texting to talking. So we get to the end of the day and we're forced to admit, I really didn't connect with anybody today. In our technological world, loneliness and a lack of real connection is fairly commonplace. Another type of loneliness is what I'll call situational loneliness. Back in 1967, Thomas Holmes published what's today called the Social Readjustment Rating Scale. It's an instrument by which we measure a person's level of stress. It's interesting if you look at the top five stressors of life. Here they are. Death of a spouse, divorce, marital separation, jail term, or death of a close family member. What do all five of those situations have in common? Loneliness is a major component in each and every one of them. So you could say loneliness is really one of the top stressors of life. These stressors and the effect of these stressors can last an entire year or longer. The final type of loneliness is what we call chronic loneliness. Chronic loneliness refers to people who feel lonely for two or more years at a time when no traumatic event has necessarily taken place. Often this type of loneliness shares a link with depression. So those are the types of loneliness. Now let's turn our attention to the predictable path of loneliness. When we start to feel lonely, what typically happens in us and to us? Well, the first experience is almost always pain. Pain like, you know, some sort of loss. It can be like the issues I just talked about, a death, a divorce, an incarceration, kids leave home, a retirement. When the people we've counted on to give us support are gone, we feel cut off and completely alone. Losses in life can trigger loneliness. But sometimes the roots of that pain and that loneliness go deeper than that. Our pain has its roots in our wounding from the past. Uh, maybe it was an abusive parent, a partner who hurt us badly, or a friend who betrayed us. We've all had experiences with various levels of rejection, and no one likes to be hurt. So we learn to be cautious in relationship. We become more careful each time just to make sure that we don't get zinged. If it happens often enough, we gradually begin to build a protective shell around our life. Just stop letting people in altogether. This is why Alain de Botton said this, Loneliness is the price of being safe from emotional hurt. It's the tax for living behind walls. Now, I'm sure most of you recognize the name Thomas Kincaid. He's the famous painter of light. But you may not know the reason he always painted light windows in all of his works of art. As a child, he hated returning home each night and finding his house completely dark. The loneliness of that dark house left a wound in the heart of Thomas Kincaid that remained with him his entire life. Not only did his artwork reflect that, but maybe that's also what contributed to his alcoholism as well. It was a loneliness wound that made Thomas Kincaid who he was. So pain is the first downward step in the spiral of loneliness, but it's often followed by the second thing, which is passivity. 
Too often, lonely people become passive and begin hoping and wishing that someone would come and rescue them out of their loneliness. It's important for you to hear me saying this. Loneliness is a passive state. It's maintained by passively letting it continue and doing nothing to change it. In other words, we hope it'll go away, but we do nothing except let it envelop us. Alan Lloyd McGinnis addressed this very thing. He said, in talking with lonely people, I've often discovered that though they lament their lack of close companions, they actually place little emphasis on the cultivation of friends. So we know we're lonely. We know we lack relationships that are close and meaningful, but then we do nothing to cultivate those relationships. And cultivate is really the right word because great relationships, close relationships, don't just happen. We have to work to make them happen. We have to allot time for conversations, getting together, getting to know one another. We have to work through the relationship hiccups that occur because all relationships have hiccups. And through time and testing, relationships become meaningful. You'll never get out of the mire of loneliness unless and until you take personal responsibility for your situation. The solution to loneliness lies within the lonely person not within someone else. That's good news because it also means that no one has to stay lonely. But if we don't take responsibility for our loneliness, if we remain passive, then we will invariably move to stage three, which is pity parties. Loneliness is always made worse by what we tell ourselves about it. We tell ourselves stuff like, loneliness is a sign of weakness and immaturity, or there must be something wrong with me if I'm lonely, or I'm the only one who feels this way. In other words, we begin to see loneliness as a defect in our personality or character. Once you believe the lie that loneliness is a defect, you'll be less likely to take social risk or invite someone over or initiate a phone call or introduce yourself at a party or participate in a small group. You'll see yourself in a negative light and you'll evaluate yourself in light of that negativity. But not just that, you'll actually seek out others who will do the same. Did you know that studies have found that we tend to create relationships that perpetuate the view we already have of ourselves. Get this, a few years back, Professor William Swan of the University of Texas reported that people with negative self views prefer and even seek out people who will evaluate them in the same way. In other words, if you don't properly value you, it's highly unlikely that anybody else in your relational world will either. Instead, you'll most likely seek out and find those who mirror back the negativity and the pessimistic views you already have of yourself. So lonely people will often do things that perpetuate the loneliness. I did this my sophomore year in college. My parents had just divorced. I hadn't heard from my dad in months since he'd left mom for another woman. Mom was living in an apartment in Springfield, Virginia. The year before, the girl I dated for years thought I would marry, cheated on me, had a baby by a married man. And I wasn't getting along with the guys I typically hung out with either. So I was depressed and I was lonely. And all I did was mope around and feel sorry for myself. I finally went to see one of my professors to talk about my problems. I'll never forget, after I spilled my guts, I was confident I was going to hear him say, you have every right to feel sorry for yourself. That would devastate even the strongest among us. Instead, he looked at me and he asked, have you looked up to see the color of the leaves lately? And I said, yeah. But inside, I'm thinking, what a moron. I mean, he's not even listening to me. But then he goes on to say, Keith, you've developed an incoming orientation toward life. You're filtering everything through how it affects you. You need an outgoing orientation where you start noticing other things and people outside yourself. And then he added this. There are two types of self-centered people in the world. The one who always thinks of themselves in a positive way, whom we consider arrogant and selfish. And then there's a person who always thinks of themselves in a negative way. But if you're always thinking about yourself, whether positively or negatively, you're self-centered. He was right. I was self-centered. My every thought, even though it was negative, was always and only about myself. I needed to shift my focus outward and not continue to stay so inwardly focused. But the thing I'll never forget is how right after I walked out of his office, I looked up into the trees and there wasn't a leaf on any tree. It was winter. They'd all fallen off and I hadn't even noticed. 
I had just told Mr. Four Lines confidently that I'd seen the leaves in the trees, even though there were none. It only reinforced the truth that my focus was downward and inward. You know, I had the best laugh that day, and it was the beginning of my healing. In India, they have a term for this. They call it having a monkey mind. That's because one of the characteristics of monkeys is they grab hold of things and they're not willing to let them go once they have it in their hand. This trait has been used to advantage by hunters who will capture monkeys using a monkey trap. Now, the trap is typically uh, a banana that's placed inside either a woven box or a hollowed out piece of fruit. The hole is just big enough for the monkey to get his hand inside, but not big enough once he has hold of that banana to pull it out with his clenched fist around it. Because the monkey is so obsessed with holding onto the banana, it stays there until it's captured. When our mind clings to thoughts that control and consume us, we have a monkey mind. We don't let go of them, even though they capture us and defeat us. So if we don't break the cycle of pain, passivity, and pity parties, we end up at stage four, which is more pain. You see, once you permit yourself to feed this cycle, you become desperate. Then you start looking for quick and easy fixes to your situation. And quick and easy usually means not dealing with the true cause of your loneliness. So you might become needy and, and manipulate people as you try to use people to meet your needs and relieve the egg. Or you might find a way to numb out so you don't have to feel what you're feeling at all. Substance abuse is an unhealthy tool some of us use to cope with holiday loneliness. In fact, more than one in five Americans will depend on alcohol and or drugs during this time of the year just to cope with their feelings of loneliness. And for 9% of us, substance abuse is a frequent problem. Something else that invites more pain is too much time on social media. Study after study has found that the more time we spend on social sharing sites like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, the more we're going to struggle with loneliness. This seems to be backed up by a study done in 2017 by the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. What they found was this. People who report, report spending more than two hours a day on social media were twice as likely to feel lonely than those who spent half an hour on those sites. Bottom line, some of us are perpetuating our own loneliness by doing things that only add fuel to the fire. Now, it could be that you see yourself in one or all the stages of the downward spiral of loneliness, but there's hope. And in our time remaining, I'd like to talk to you about God's remedy for loneliness. Now, the first step in breaking free of the downward cycle is simply this, your attitude, moving away from a victim mentality. It's easy to look at loneliness as something inflicted on us by a cruel and unfeeling world, but we have more say in our loneliness than what we think. Change always begins with a new attitude, an attitude that says, today I'm going to handle loneliness differently. I'm going to focus on breaking through and out of my isolation by reaching out to others. That's the first step, being intentional about meeting new people. Now, don't go out with the agenda like you've got to find this one person who's going to fill up all your loneliness. If you do that, you might as well wear a sign that says emotional black hole because no one person is going to be able to meet all the needs that you have for connection. If you want to break out of loneliness, stop saying, I have no friends, and start being a friend. Stop focusing on what you're not getting, and start focusing on what you're giving. Give yourself away. It's a guaranteed cure for loneliness. Even the Bible says the same thing. In Proverbs 18, 24, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. The fact is this, a lot of loneliness is our fear of love. We're afraid to be open. We're afraid to be vulnerable. We're afraid to show how we really feel. We're afraid to risk a relationship because we might be rejected. But when we don't give ourselves away, we guarantee our loneliness. So take a risk, start reaching out to others, and your loneliness will begin to disappear. A second essential in God's remedy for loneliness is solitude, which is about connecting with God. You know, it was Paul Tillich who once wisely observed, our language has wisely sensed the two sides of being alone. It's created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone. And it's created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. Now, I know this probably sounds like the last thing you expected to hear me say today. But honestly, one of the best remedies for loneliness is solitude. It may sound crazy, like it's the last thing you need. But friends, loneliness is not about being alone. It's about feeling alone. 
You can be alone and not feel lonely at all. Think of it like this. Solitude and loneliness are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Loneliness is an empty feeling of being alone, of, of not feeling connected, like we don't belong anywhere and no one understands us. Solitude is the other end of the spectrum. It's a sense of being deeply connected both to who we are and to God. It's an inner experience which says, whether I'm with people or not, I found my sense of belonging with God. Henry Nouwen was an interesting man. He left teaching at Harvard University to go work as a chaplain with the mentally disabled. In his book, Reaching Out, he said this, to live the spiritual life, we must enter the desert of our loneliness and there create a garden of solitude. Now, for most people, being alone is the same thing as loneliness. But in the spiritual life, being alone affords us the opportunity to be with God, not disconnected, but vitally reconnected with the one who knows and loves us best. So think about this. Jesus knew loneliness. He knew the loneliness of being abandoned by the people who professed to love him and left him to die on the cross. He knew the loneliness of being completely misunderstood, even by his own family and his hand-picked disciples. Jesus knew the loneliness of living among people, walking their roads, healing their sick, feeding their hungry. But even after all of that, some accused him of being demon-possessed, and people still asked him, who are you? When Jesus answered their question, he did it by pointing to his relationship with God. He said, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Whenever Jesus experienced the gnawing pain of loneliness, he turned to his father. Jesus consistently sought solitude. He would leave the crowds to go to a solitary place where he would gather his strength and lean on his heavenly father. One of the main reasons we feel lonely is we neglect that primary connection we have with God. So solitude is different from loneliness. For Jesus, solitude was not so much the experience of being away from people as much as it was the experience of being with God. It was facing loneliness head on. It was in solitude that he discovered he was not alone, that God was with him and had been with him all along. Bottom line, solitude helps me to recognize I'm never without God. Solitude is the cure for loneliness because in solitude, I finally recognize that there is one who's always present with me. When we practice solitude as God intended, it actually destroys the darkness of loneliness because we become convinced that God is with us. And I'll tell you why this works. Because solitude enables me to see myself as I am, which is actually what we most fear in solitude. Dallas Willard said it like this, silence is frightening because it strips us as nothing else does, throwing us upon the stark realities of life. For many of us, our greatest temptation is to fill every minute with noise. That's based on fear. Fear that the empty moments will drudge up something we'd rather not face. Solitude is where the real you comes out. Solitude is where the layers get stripped away. But more importantly, in solitude, God can love the real, struggling, vulnerable, fearful you because that's really you. Richard Foster reminds us that solitude is one of the deepest disciplines of the spiritual life because it crucifies our need for importance and prominence. It crucifies it. That means it puts it to death. When we're totally alone before God, there's no one to perform for. There's no one to applaud us. There's no one to say, good job. There's no one to look at what we've accomplished and affirm us or bless me. There's no one to affirm my value and tell me that I matter, except, of course, God himself. But unfortunately for some of us, we're still looking past God to other people to affirm our value, to remind us that we matter. So being totally alone is a very difficult experience because there's no one there to do that for us. Henry Nouwen described how our initial experience in complete quiet and aloneness with God is likely to feel. He said, solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Rather, it is a place of conversion, the place where the old self dies and the new self is born. In solitude, all the things I typically use to prop up my life are now gone. No friends to talk with, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, no books to distract me, just me. Vulnerable, broken, sinful me, just as I am, to borrow the words of the old hymn. It's that nothingness that I dread. Everything within me wants to run back to my friends, my work, and my distractions so that I can forget my nothingness. But God shows up in the midst of all of that. 
the God who knows us as we are. He has shown us what we are, and he settled in his love for us just the way we are. Christmas is supposed to remind us of that truth. Do you remember the announcement of the birth of Christ? Listen to what the angel said to Joseph. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. Emmanuel, that's very good news for the lonely. Jesus' birth, his central truth, means God is with us, all of us, especially all the lonely people. Jesus is with you, even when you feel distant, unengaged, misunderstood, and and unseen. Jesus is with you, even when you feel like nobody's looking at you or paying a bit of attention to you. But you need to practice being with him. That's what solitude is all about. Practice at being with God so that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's with you even when it seems that everyone else has abandoned you or doesn't care. The final tool in God's remedy for loneliness, gratitude. Seeing loneliness as a gift. Too often we run away from the experience of loneliness. Philip Yancey wrote an excellent article called A World With No Lonely People. And in it, he said this, Sometimes I yearn for a world without loneliness. What would it be like if we were all self-confident? If we didn't need people to smile at us and notice us? If we were all like perfect rounded eggs with a smiley decal pasted on our face? And as I fantasize, I inevitably come back to the strange conclusion, thank you, God, for loneliness. Why would anybody be thankful for loneliness? Well, Yancey says this, because it's the one thing within me that forces me to reach out to other people. Loneliness is a gift that God has given us. It's similar to physical pain. When I have a physical pain, it's an alert my body sends out to pay attention to whatever or wherever my body is hurting. It's the body's early warning system. That is, if you keep doing this, you might do yourself a long-term injury. Loneliness is like that, except it's emotional pain, an early warning system that something is off in our relationships. It's supposed to cause us to seek others and to turn away from our isolation. God has made us for connection. He put within us a desire to belong to other people. That's the way we're made. All of life comes down to two basic commands. At least that's what Jesus taught us. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Which means all of life can be reduced to our horizontal and vertical relationships. The best barometer of how your life is going and where your life is headed is based on the quality of the relationship you have with others and with God. When we feel lonely, it's our early warning system to pay attention to what's happening or what's not happening between us and God and others. My job is a lonely profession. Most people don't understand the pressures pastors feel to keep the ministry going and vibrant, the weight they feel to make sure all the other pastors on staff are well paid for or well paid and taken care of, the burden of carrying so many hurts and heartaches in the congregation coupled with their own challenges and problems. I can tell you this from the heart. No minister has longevity in the ministry without intentionally developing a strong relationship with God and with others. This is my lifeline. It's the only reason I'm still in the ministry today. One, because I live in a very settled place in my relationship with God. And two, I have great people who get me, love me, and are always there for me. So what I'm telling you is I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where you can find bread. None of the stuff I've told you about today is theory for me. It's all practice. It's what I do. It's how I live. And it works. Begin your journey out of loneliness today by reaching up and reaching out because you're worth it. Let's pray. Father, you are so real. Your truth is so relatable. And even more than 2,000 years after we find these truths in the pages of Scripture, it's just like ripping a page out of modern psychology, teaching us the best way to live. God, there are so many at this time of the year who are very much in touch with the fact that they're lonely. It could be that they can't relate to their family. There's been so much pain. Uh, People are so interested in themselves that they just feel so disconnected where they're at. Many people are feeling uh, lonely and they're dealing with it in all the wrong ways. They're, 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 getting desperate and they try to use people or or they try to numb out on the feelings or or they do things that continue to add to the pain like getting caught up in social media and and examining and making unfair comparisons between the lives of others and themselves 
God, it's so easy once we're in pain to, to get passive about that, to do nothing, to think that it'll resolve itself on its own. If we remain passive long enough, we begin to engage in pity parties and, and poor miserable me and, and begin to tell ourselves things that are not true that, again, just reinforce everything that we think that's wrong. And so, God, I pray that you would give us the courage to make a shift in our attitude to embrace solitude as a wonderful gift that you've given us, to make a connection with you that will sustain us no matter what our relationship world looks like. And God, not just that, that we would have a sense of gratitude, that you've given us the gift of loneliness that prompts us when things are going awry, that when relationships are not what they were intended to be, that you've given us an early warning system to pay attention and to do something about our horizontal and vertical relationships in that moment. God, I just thank you that, that during this time of the year, when more than half of people are battling with loneliness, that as a church, we can carve out this time and speak to the real issues that people are facing. I pray, God, that you would use this to bring hope and a new beginning in someone's life today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so grateful that you would choose to join us, whether you're joining us Sunday morning at 930 or you're joining us sometime later on the day or in the week. We're glad that you would choose to make Spring Creek a part of your week. Please, I encourage you to like the message, share the message, support the church, continue to make a difference in your world. And when you share this and when you share how you've been affected, know that half of the people that you're meeting out there are struggling with loneliness. And sometimes just hearing somebody who gets it, who understands it, who cares, can make a difference in someone's life today. I pray this is a blessed week for you. I pray that the Christmas holiday holds a lot of special memories for you and the people that you care about. God bless you. See you next week.